Okay. Oh, Everybody here for the Burlington Wine Club? Okay. So I just, I just, a little bit of housekeeping. So we are recording this session, uh, but you, it just started like a moment ago. You can turn off your video if you don't want to be recorded, so you can just eliminate your picture. Um, actually, there's a Q&A box and a chat box, but I think tonight we'll just use the chat box. So as we go through the presentation, if you have any questions, for, if you have any comments, or you like a pairing, um, or there's something that's interesting, type it into the chat box. And there'll be a little box at the bottom. You just click on chat and then type whatever you want. And if you have any questions about the pairings, um, rather than unmuting yourself and uh, throughout the presentation, um, just put your question in the chat box. And Kirsten is our co-host tonight, and she's going to be checking the chat box for questions and comments. And um, she'll interrupt whenever she thinks that it's a good time and go through the questions, okay? Um, we have a speaker mode and a gallery mode. The gallery mode shows all the individual people as well as the presentation, um, and, or you can be in speaker mode and not see all of the individual people. people. So it's entirely up to you. Okay, last time, it's been ages since we've been together. So it's January now and our last official meeting was in October, and we had the Christmas party in November. Like, it just seems like so long ago. But we had the Mediterranean Christmas dinner with Chef Maggie, and uh, I think, you know, a whole bunch of you were there. Um, I thought the food was great. Um, anyway, it was interesting, and we'll do it again next year. Coming up, we have the next three events planned. Um, Darlene and Marie who we've had before. She used to be with Unibid um, uh, and Spirits. She's now with the parent company, Dan Durant. So she's coming back and she's going to have a new, whole new portfolio and a new set of wines uh, to share with us. And then in March, uh, Nancy Kennedy is representing Malabar, and she has the winemaker, Shiraz, is going to join her. And uh, we'll have some pure Ontario, lovely Malabar wines. And Danielle, obviously you like them because that's what you're drinking tonight. Right. Yes. And then April, we'll have Sylvester Wine and Spirits, uh, Lindsay Groves. Um, she's the Tiller Flatgate Court, but she also handles a lot of their wines as well. So it'll be a wine presentation. Um, and she'll be here in April. Then I said, so we're going to be virtual through April. I'm erring on the side of caution, uh, and then hopefully live in May. And I'll kind of keep you posted each month as to what's happening and what, if any, discussions I've had with the art gallery or any other venues uh, for when we can get back live, okay? And if anybody has any suggestions for venues or ideas for what we can do come May, please don't hesitate to send me an email uh, at any time, okay? I'm open to suggestions. And we will get live again one of these days. Anyway, tonight, wine and cheese, a masterclass. And I use the term loosely. Um, okay, I'm in gallery mode, and I might switch if I can. Let's see. Just because it's thumbnail. Nope. Okay. All right, so we have the master class. Oh, there we go. Okay. For tonight. And obviously I'm giving it. Okay. So what we're going to talk about tonight is just a few simple things. First of all, we're going to talk a little bit about the cheese categories. Uh, the different types of cheese. And then we'll talk about some different wine styles. And then we'll spend the bulk of the time doing wine and cheese pairing. So in your kit, you will have received a chart. So we're going to use that chart, and you have some cheeses, and hopefully you have some crackers, and you have all of your wines, and we'll work uh, through all of the different wine and cheese pairings. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about creating and serving cheese platters with wine. 
just going to, there we go. Okay. So cheese categories and wine styles, and I'll talk in more detail about each of them. But there's really, there's fresh cheese, the different categories of cheese, fresh, uh, soft, semi-soft, firm, hard, and then blue cheese. Okay, so basic categories. And then in terms of wine styles, I'm going to focus on the white wines and the red wines tonight because you have three whites and you have three reds. But I have highlighted the sparkling and the fortified because if you've started with the sparkling, um, as we like to do, um, please keep some of your sparkling for your cheeses because what you'll find is the sparkling is a really, really good pairing with a lot of the cheeses. Okay, so save a little bit, sip your sparkling, but save a little bit to taste with your cheeses. Uh, we're not going to talk about the rosés or the sweets tonight. Um, and for those of you that brought a fortified, and if you happen to have a Stilton or a blue and a fortified, that's um, another, you know, classic pairing and really interesting thing to do. Um, we couldn't include it in the kit, but if you happen to have some, um, that's a good thing to bring out as well. Okay, so the cheese is to taste. By the way, is my, so I'm seeing a block of pictures in front of my screen. Is it blocking the words for you guys? No? Okay, just me. Okay, so the cheese to taste and the wines to taste tonight. Okay, we have six cheeses, a cream cheese, a laughing cow, which is also a, a soft cheese, a borson, a cheddar, a smoky cheddar and a gouda. So we have a number of firm cheeses and we have some soft cheeses and we have some fresh cheese. And then if you, um, in the reason we picked though, I picked those cheeses was because they were all individually prepared at the store. Um, so I could buy them already packaged and reduce the amount of food contact this month and COVID issues and all that kind of stuff. But I also suggested that if you have it at home or if you're interested, a goat cheese would have been a really good one to add to this, as well as a brie or a camembert and a Stilton or blue cheese. So if you have those, awesome. If you don't, you've got six to work with anyway. And then the wines. Okay, so we have a Pinot Grigio, a Sauvignon Blanc, and a Chardonnay. So three quite different white wines and very familiar white wines. And they're all Canadian, um, but they're quite different in flavor. And then the same with the reds. We have a Pinot Noir, so a light red, a Cabernet Sauvignon, and a Shiraz. So three very different flavored red wines. And then, as I said, if you have your sparkling wine, keep it. Don't drink it all before we get to the cheeses. Um, because it'd be a really good one to try with a number of the cheeses. And then pork was also optional. And of course, we're not going to get into all the different types of ports, but if you've got a Tawny and Stilton, or even if you've got a, a Ruby port or a white port, um, they're interesting choices with the cheeses. And again, if you, as I'm going through this, if you have any questions, just type them into the chat box. Okay. And at some point we'll stop and we'll answer your questions. Okay, so the first three types of cheese. We have a fresh cheese, and these cheeses are defined primarily in terms of their um, um, longevity and also their moisture content. So fresh cheeses are young, um, high moisture cheeses. They're eaten shortly after they're made. They're things like cottage cheese, cream cheese, feta, pork, ricotta, and they have a, a relatively limited uh, shelf life. So you can keep them in the fridge for like up to a month, but they're new, fresh, light, lively cheeses, no aging, no nothing, very simple cheeses. Um, I don't know if you've ever made a ricotta, but you can make it overnight and then eat it that day. That's really, you know, how you do it. So then the soft cheeses, Slightly less moisture, so a little bit firmer. They're matured for a short while, um, and they can be refrigerated for two to four, for up to two months. And things like brie, camembert, and your goat cheese. Okay, so just a little more um, 
firmness, a little bit of maturity in some cases, um, but still very soft cheeses. Then you're semi-soft. So now we're getting into some of the, the I was going to say more interesting cheeses, but that's not fair because cream cheese and camembert and chevre and goat cheese are, are, are lovely as well. But these are firmer cheeses than the soft cheeses. They have moisture of 40 to 60 percent. Um, and there's three different styles, really. There's the unripened, which is the lightest. Um, so they're not matured. They're unripened bocconcini and mozzarella. So, you know, and like a nice, fresh mozzarella. And it's soft and the, or, or the bocconcini as well. Um, and they're just, they're relatively simple, um, but lots of flavor. And then the interior ripened. So the interior ripened cheese means the whole cheese has been ripened throughout. Uh, so the cassata and the Monterey Jack. And I have to admit, I've never actually had a cassata. So if anybody has, you know, make a comment in the chat box. But Monterey Jack is a staple in my house. Um, and then surface, surface ripened. So okra and Limburger. So the cheeses that um, are ripened on the outside, so have some kind of film. And these cheeses are all, um, their shelf life is two to four months. So a little bit longer as each one gets a little less moisture and a little bit more maturity. They can also last a little bit longer. So fresh, soft and semi soft. And then we've got firm cheeses. And these are the cheeses that, well, these, the firm and the hard cheeses are arguably the cheeses that we're most familiar with here or use on a day to day basis. So Edam, Gouda, Munster and cheddar. You know, we use cheddar cheese for lots of things. And we've got a Gouda, we've got a cheddar, and we've got a smoky cheddar tonight. So we have three firm cheeses. Um, and they're good for three months to a year. And they're firmer for sure, um, much more solid. And one of the things we were talking about earlier today is, so we have the orange cheddar here, but the, that's, and I think it's unique to Canada. There may be, uh, there may be other places that have orange cheddar. But the, the orange is actually a dye that's added to the cheddar. Most cheddar is naturally white. And in most countries, you only ever see white cheddar. But here we have our, our orange cheddar. Don't know why, but it's certainly been a tradition here. So then hard cheeses. Okay, again, great cooking cheeses, only 25 to 35% uh, moisture, much longer shelf life. Parmesan, Romano, Pecorino. So Pecorino is from Tuscany, um, but has the same texture as par uh, Parmesan and Romano. So good hard cheese for either grating or if you want it on a cheese board, um, you can use um, like a potato peeler and do um, skips of the of Parmesan, which is very nice on a cheese board. And then lastly, our blue cheeses, so our Stilton and our Roquefort. Um, so they've had mold, so they're, they're blue veins. They've had actually mold inserted, um, which is kind of interesting, but they make um, excellent cheeses, very strong in flavor. Um, but they also range from very soft to semi-soft or almost medium bodied. And some of the very soft um, blue cheeses are also very, very mild. So they're not all um, huge, over-the-top, strong cheeses. They range from uh, soft to pretty pungent. Um, and here's where, if you happen to have a port, the Stilton and the port are a classic pairing. And I've often said, um, I am not a Stilton or a blue cheese fan unless I have port. All of a sudden, if I have a port with those cheeses, then both, then they taste good. So, and I'm hoping too, that as we go through the, the wine and cheese pairings, that even if there's a wine that wasn't your favorite or a cheese that wasn't your favorite, if you find the right combination, all of a sudden you will like both. Okay. So white wine styles. So and we're going to stop after the white wines and do the white wine and cheese tasting. OK, I won't talk for hours before you get food. 
So white wines, crisp, lean whites. So good acidity, minerality, some spritz, thirst quenching, summer wines out in the backyard in the summer on a hot day. With You can eat it with or without food. And those are wines like the Albarino from Spain, the Suave from Italy. So if you go to an Italian restaurant at lunchtime and you're looking at the wine list, typically one of the best wines to have with your Italian meal at lunch is a Suave. Nice, bright, fresh, white, good uh, food wine, the Suave. Vino Verde. Vino Verde is one of the, I wouldn't say few wines, but not all wines, that has a natural spritz to it. So Vino Verde is a... A uh, young green wine from Portugal that has, um, it's, it's effervescent. It has bubbles, but it's natural. It is not done. It's not made in the sparkling, any of the sparkling methods. There's no CO2 included. It's, it's just a natural product. And again, it's a light, fun, bright, cheerful, uh, everyday wine. And then the Pinot Grigio. So Pinot Grigio is typically from Italy. But here in Ontario, we make a lot of decent Pinot Grigio. And so that's your first wine tonight is the Pinot Grigio. And then aromatic whites. <clears throat> so this is an awesome category of whites, especially for Ontario. They're fragrant wines. And we say they've got energy and sophistication and aromatics. There's a lot of life to them. So Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand or Sancerre, or Ontario, uh, and other places as well. But so these are some of the named places that would have great Sauvignon Blanc. High acid, good, strong flavors. You're going to, it'll be interesting. Here's where if you have a goat cheese, the goat cheese and the Sauvignon Blanc are the natural pairings. For one thing, a Sancerre is a... Um, uh, an area in the Loire and the town next to it specializes in goat cheese. So you've got a Sancerre, which is a Sauvignon Blanc from France and the town next door where they make goat cheese. And it's just a, a natural pairing. Um, so, and our Ontario um, goat cheese and our Ontario um, Sauvignon Blanc make really good pairings as well. <clears throat> The next is a Gewürztraminer. So Gewürz is got lots of flavor, lots of aromatics, and is a very good food wine. If you're ever having spicy foods or curries or you're not sure what um, wine to pair with your cheese, you get a smoky cheese or a Gouda or something that's a little bit different, try a Gewürztraminer. Pinot Gris. <clears throat> so Pinot Gris is the same grape as Pinot Grigio but it's done in the French style and it's more of a food wine. So where Pinot Grigio is light, good acidity, minerality, uh, everyday drinking, Pinot Gris might have some oak. It might be a little bit heavier. It's been on the vine a little bit longer. It has a, it has stronger characteristics and you often like to have a Pinot Gris with um, food. And so it's a different, um, uh, cheese pairing than the Pinot Grigio because it would go with some of the heavier cheeses. The Riesling, Riesling's great. Again, an aromatic um, wine, lots of flavor, lots of apple. Um, anyway, we don't have one to try tonight. And the only one that we don't really make a lot of here in Ontario is the Chenin Blanc. Chenin Blanc is from South Africa. And my guess as to why we don't is because South Africa is a hot climate, whereas all the others, New Zealand, uh, Alsace, Oregon, Germany, are cool climates like Ontario. So we can make all of those varieties here and we can make them very, very well. So anyway, if you're ever looking for or you're wanting to introduce people to good Ontario wines, this is the category to look at for and especially for for guests from out of town, this, these really are our specialties here in Ontario. Lastly, we've got full-bodied whites, and we have one of those tonight. Okay, so the full-bodied whites are higher in alcohol. They can handle some oak. 
Um, and sometimes I'll put the Pinot Gris in this category, although it would be on the lighter side. But Chardonnay for sure. Okay, we have a Chardonnay here tonight. And you can have an Anouk Chardonnay, which is a little bit lighter. Or the Chardonnay, of course, can handle some oak. And you have all different styles of Chardonnay. So we have an Ontario Chardonnay here that has some oak, but it's not over the top oaky. Marsan Rosan, if you get a chance to try those wines, they're from the Rhone in France, and they are, they're full-bodied white wines as well. All of these wines you'd want to have with food. They're less just sipping wines, um, and certainly not sipping outside in the sunshine. You want to have them nice and cool, and you want to have some food to go with them. Okay, Marsan Rosan, Semillon. So Semillon is the main grape in Sauterne, and Sauterne is awesome with cheese, with many, many cheeses. But Semillon is also made in the dry style, but it's a very perfumed wine, and it's often mixed with uh, Sauvignon Blanc, um, but it can stand on its own as well. So it's a, it's a full-bodied white. The Torontes from Argentina is a full-bodied white. And if you get a chance to try that, that's a very nice wine. And it's a really good food wine. And Viognier. Uh, Viognier takes some getting used to if you haven't had it before. It's a very perfumey wine. It's an unctuous wine. Like it's a mouth coating wine. You put it in your mouth and you feel it. Okay. So, and it has a very distinct uh, flavor. Um, but if you get a chance to try it, and again, some of the cheeses would go with these uh, full-bodied whites. So when we get into the heavier cheeses, they often talk about them only going with red wines, right? And everybody thinks, oh, red wines with your big cheeses. This group of wines can also go with those big cheeses. So if you're a white wine drinker or you're having other foods that pair better with a white wine, you can have these wines with some of your firmer, bigger, bolder cheeses. Okay. Any questions before we go to the chart? Actually, yeah. Okay. So a quick summary, and then we'll start to taste. Cheese category, fresh. So cottage cheese, cream cheese, quark, ricotta, really fresh. Sparkling wine goes with these. And your Pinot Grigio. Okay, light lean whites, so there could be others as well, but tonight we have a Pinot Grigio. So for your soft cheeses, it could be a Brie Camembert, if you happen to get some, your Laughing Cow and your Borson. Sparkling again, goes with these wines. Also your Pinot Grigio and your Sauvignon Blanc. So now we've got three different wines that we can try with these foods, and you can get a sense for what you like with which cheese. So then the semi-soft, so we don't really have any of the semi-soft cheeses. So I'll just say sparkling. And now we're getting into a Chardonnay, so a bigger, fuller-bodied um, wine with these cheeses and a light red, a Pinot Noir. So if you happen to have any of those, do give that a try. And then the firm cheeses. Okay, so provolone, so we've got a cheddar, a smoky cheddar, and a gouda. So three of the cheeses tonight are in this category. And fortunately, we have three wines that probably go pretty well with them. Full-bodied white, so your Chardonnay, so your Pinot Noir, and your Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so your full-bodied red, and it's behind my screen, but I suspect it says the Shiraz as well. So full bodied red and then the hard cheeses, we don't have any, but Chardonnay and your full bodied reds go with those as well. So if you're using a shaved Parmesan sometime, they go well with nice full bodied reds. And then of course your Stilton and your Port or your Blue and your Port. And the other thing that goes really well um, with these cheeses is good old ice wine. So if you have some ice wine around, a good sweet wine with your Stilton or with your Roquefort is lovely. Okay. All right. Ready to taste? Okay. So let's, so the first, let's just work on the whites and the cheeses. So we get a Pinot Grigio, a Sauvignon Blanc, and a Chardonnay. And take your, so what I like to do is take your first cheese 
and taste it with each of the three whites. Okay, so take, you know, uh, take a moment. Try it. And then I'm going to want to know what your favorite pairing is for each of the cheeses. And so you can just put it in the chat room. So it's either um, Pinot Grigio, Sauvignon Blanc, or Chardonnay. So you can just say one, two, or three. And I don't want to be chewing into my microphone. So, what? First time with a headset. So I'll have to be a little bit careful. But again, in terms of how to taste, have a sip of your wine. Then taste your cheese on a bit of a cracker or on its own. And then have another sip of your wine. And if the pairing is right, the wine will taste better the second time you taste it than the first time you tasted it. And as you're going through this, they say as well that if you are you buy on apple and you sell on cheese. And what that means is if you're buying wines, you slice up some apple and taste the apple at the same time as you're tasting the wine. Because if there are any flaws in the wine or if the wine isn't wonderful, the apple will just destroy the wine. Whereas if you're selling wine, sell it with cheese because cheese enhances the flavors of the wines. Cheese will make a ho hum wine taste better. So you buy with apples and sell with cheese. Okay. I've never heard that, Teresa. But that is a wonderful, I'll remember that because I, that makes total sense to me. Yeah. And that's why you will often see when wines are being sold that there there are cheeses available. Mm. Wonderful information here, Teresa. We do have a couple of questions from the chat room. Okay. Uh, so far, really enjoying the wines and wondering if you would share some of the brands and what we're drinking. I know you mentioned Ontario. Yep. They were wondering if you could say um, what we're actually drinking. Sure. The brand name. Okay. So these wines are all what I call ordinaires. So they're all the, the first three wines, the reds are a little bit different, are Jackson Triggs, entry level, Pinot Grigio, Sauvignon Blanc, and Chardonnay. And I will tell you, they are box wines. But they have they have the flavors of the of the the varietals that they're representing. So I thought they would work. Wonderful house wines, actually. Really yeah. enjoying I'm really enjoying the Pinot Grigio. Excellent. It's got some flavor to it, doesn't it? It's it's decent. It's a very good yeah. wine. Wonderful, wonderful house wine. Yep. Yeah. And the Sauvignon Blanc is uh, not quite over the top uh, New Zealand style, which not everybody likes, but it's got good acidity. It's got that Sauvignon Blanc flavor. And uh, for any uh, acidic um, cheeses, um, it'll work. And then the Chardonnay. So I like the Chardonnay. Um, it's lightly oaked. So it's not over the top heavy oaked. It's like it's an everyday Pleasant drinking Chardonnay, and you can drink it with or without food, but it'll hold up to some of the cheeses. So has everybody tried each of the cheeses with each of the whites? Or are you still working through it? it? Takes a while, no hurry. I find the Sauvignon Blanc is nice and it's quite subtle, but it's really beautiful. It reminds me a little bit more of a French or Loire style. Really, really nice. Mm. I find 
for me, a Sauvignon Blanc offsets some of the richness or creaminess of some of the softer cheeses. Like the Pinot Grigio is probably compatible. To me, it's on the same level. But the Sauvignon Blanc, if I've got something that's really, really creamy and mouth coating, then the Sauvignon Blanc just kind of clears my palate. So, Teresa, we're getting some really positive comments. Danielle is saying that she loves the Chardonnay with the touch of the oak. Lydia and Julia said that they love, really love the cream cheese with the Pinot Grigio. Yeah. And uh, Shelley agreed, the cream cheese and Pinot Grigio is the way to go. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, you don't, you don't often think of Pinot Grigio as being a cheese wine, right? But for some of these softer cheeses, and if you have a, a Pinot Grigio that's got some flavor to it, it just, the balance is right. And again, I always try and strive for balance. So if you've got a heavy food or a heavy cheese, you want a heavier wine. Because you want the weight to be about the same. So how was the, the cheddar or the Gouda with the Chardonnay? Was the Chardonnay strong enough for it? Heather is saying that she loved the Chardonnay with the cream cheese as well. Ah. And the Sauvignon Blanc she enjoyed. I actually, I'm with the, I'm with you. I like the Chardonnay and the cream cheese. I thought that was a nice pairing. Excellent. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what about the sparkling? Did anybody try the sparkling with any of the wines? We have a lot of fans. We have a lot of fans of your Chardonnay choice, Teresa. Ah. Diana saying she loves the Chardonnay, even tastes great with her Perrier. Ah. And, uh, yeah, the Chardonnay with the Boursin was a great, great fit, great pair. And uh, Dale is saying they enjoyed the Sauvignon Blanc with the Boursin. Good. Okay. And, again, the Sauvignon Blanc will cut the, the creaminess. And the Chardonnay... Anything, um, well, the Chardonnay, the oak is a kind of a vanilla or a smokiness, which has an affinity to a number of different cheeses. Okay, so you know what I think we'll do? So I'm going to go on and talk about the red wine styles, and then we'll come back and do all of the red wine pairings. But maybe um, it's up to you guys. We can use the chat box again, or if you want, we can unmute for you know, five or ten minutes while you're doing the the tasting and um, you can talk. So give us some thought. Let us know which you'd rather do. Jesus, are you saying that you wouldn't mind taking a little seven inning stretch now? No, no. Or no after the, I was after to, the reds. I was going to talk about the reds, uh, the red wine styles, and then um, we'll go to the, the chart again and taste the reds. That's assuming everybody's finished with the whites. Don't let me rush you. I'm just talking here. Is everybody finished with the whites? Yes? Uh, or do you want I'm, a few more minutes? I'm still getting some comments. Okay. Uh, so I, I, yeah, I feel like maybe the group is still experimenting a little and okay. still doing Perfect. the pair. Yeah. Uh, we've got some great Really positive feedback. Dale and Lola again are saying that they love the Chardonnay with, I'm not sure. Oh, Dale, sorry. Dale is now saying, yeah, they need a few more minutes. Okay. No problem. Try them all. So Monique and Dale are both saying they love the Chardonnay with the spread them. Okay. And those are the plant-based cheeses. So Dale uh, and, Monique and Natalie have all plant-based cheeses. But in a, uh, as and Dale chose them for me. So he had a list of the cheeses that we were serving, and he his uh, he attempted to find an equivalent for each of those cheeses in a plant-based version. Oh, good choice. And Beth and Martin, here's an interesting one, Teresa. They're saying that the Laughing Cow came across slightly chocolatey when paired with the Chardonnay. 
Ah, okay. Okay, let me try. And Lydia and Julie are saying, wow, the laughing cow with the Chardonnay is a fantastic taste. What a beautiful surprise. Very positive. It's funny, chocolate wouldn't have been my first thought, but I get it. It's, I have to try that. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a minute. And it is. It's a very nice pairing. <laughs> Give me a minute. And again, remember to sit before and after. I know it takes a little bit longer, but it's, um, and sometimes I'll do a sip of wine, taste of the food, sip of wine, taste of the food, because then you get both combinations and And both Heather and Chris are saying that they love the Chardonnay with the smoky cheddar. Yes. Okay. That's That's, classic pairing. Yeah. And so anytime you've got something smoky, if you're a white wine drinker, because some of the reds will work as well, but if you're a white wine drinker, if you've got something smoky, if you've got something maple-y, um, ch- um, Chardonnay is the thing. One of the um, pairings I've done, and some of you have probably experienced it, is the maple cookies mm. and Chardonnay. Just a uh, surprisingly perfect match. So maple, smokiness, anything like that. Uh, Chardonnay with some oak in it is, is, is the way to go. That's a fantastic suggestion, Teresa, and easy to do. I will be doing that this weekend. I'm finding the Chardonnay so well balanced. Yep. Lightly oaked. It's really, really, really enjoyable. Yep. For an entry level wine, like it's beautiful. It's it it punches above its class, I think. Beautiful. Like you said in your presentation, which was full of wonderful information, Ontario whites are the way to go. Yeah, we do wonderful. We, do, we can be very, very proud of our whites. Okay. I'm gonna move on to the reds. And then once once I go through my spiel, then of course if you haven't finished the whites, you can do those and you can do the reds as well. Okay. Okay, so the red wine styles. So first of all, light, fruity reds. And we don't often think about light, fruity wet reds, but some of them are excellent. And Ontario, again, makes uh, good wines in this category because we're a cold climate, right? So we're a cool climate. And the thing that we have difficulty with sometimes is big, bold reds. Now, With the climate change, that's changing a wee bit. But our strength is not Shiraz or even Cabernet Sauvignon, okay? But we do have strength in the light fruity reds. So Gamay Noir or Beaujolais, um, the light reds, and Bachelder makes some awesome Gamays, uh, and so do some other people. So it's a light fruity red. Pinot Noir We do Pinot Noir well, and it's not easy to do good Pinot Noir. Um, Cabernet Franc um, is also a strength. Zweigelt and Blafrankisch from Austria are light fruity reds. Um, We see some of that in the northern Okanagan, but not so much in Niagara. Lambrusco is interesting. It is kind of a sparkling red. Okay, it has a natural effervescence again. Lambrusco, great, um, interesting wine and often served with dessert. And then, uh, Rioja, but only, um, uh, Hoven, which is young. Okay. So a young Rioja, an early, uh, young is a light fruity red. So they're light, fresh, acidic, fruity. And in the case of Pinot Noirs, they can also move toward being earthy. But they're light, friendly, easy drinking reds. So then we've got firm, medium body reds. Again, they've got good acidity and they've got more body and secondary flavors than, say, the light fruity reds. And these are wines like Sangiovese from Chianti in Italy, Tempranillo from Spain, Vino Tinto from Portugal, 
Adriatico from Greece, and Bordeaux or Meritage from France and North America. And of course, Meritage is the North American term for Bordeaux, right? We can't call our wines Bordeaux. So um, this is a, it's actually a legal term um, and it's, um, but it's the same term as Bordeaux and the rules are very, are very similar, not exactly the same. But um, if you see Meritage, know that it's a Bordeaux blend. Okay. And so those are our firm medium bodied reds. And yeah. And then rich full bodied reds. Okay. So these are our big bold reds. Malbec from Argentina. Nebbiola from Italy, which is your Brolos and your Barbarescos. So big bold Italian wines. Syrah or Shiraz from France and Australia, and we do do some in Ontario, and we have an Ontario one here. Cabernet Sauvignon, France, Chile, California, Ontario. Our Cabernet Sauvignons arguably are not going to be as big and bold and high alcohol as, say, the California Cabernet Sauvignons or the Australian Cabernet Sauvignons, but they're on par with some of the French because they have a cooler climate as well. Zinfandel, Primitivo, or Tribadrog, nice pronunciation, from Croatia. So Zinfandel is what it's called in California. Primitivo is the same grape in Italy. And Tribadrog is in Croatia. And the argument is that it actually came from Croatia in the first place but those three grapes are all exactly the same. And then Plavik Mali is uh, a son of um, that grape. Uh, and they come from California, Italy, and Croatia. So they're, they're big, bold reds. They're typically high alcohol. Um, they usually have more, more of a fruity flavor than, say, a Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, Zinfandel. More like a cross between a Shiraz and a Cab Soap, if you think about it. And then the Bordeaux Meritage can also be full-bodied reds. So they can be medium-bodied or they can be full-bodied. So those are our three styles of red. And what we have tonight is a Pinot Noir is your first one. So we have a light red. We have a Cabernet Sauvignon. And we have a Shiraz. And I'm just wondering if I had the, nope, the chart. Yeah, so if we look at, if we go back to the original chart, so Pinot Noir with the semi-soft, which we don't have. And so if we look at our cheddar, smoky cheddar, and our Gouda, our, so that's where we've got both our Chardonnays, but also our Pinot Noir, our Cabernet Sauvignon, and our Shiraz. And then, of course, you're still in port. Okay. So this time, we're looking at the Pinot Noir, the Cabernet Sauvignon, and the Shiraz. Uh, and then afterwards, if anybody has a port, we can talk a little bit about it. Okay. So how's the Pinot Noir and the cream? Because that's your... Lightest red and your lightest cheese. Just switch these. Give me a thumbs up if you'd like to unmute for the next uh, 10 minutes or so while you're doing your cheeses and you can actually talk about it. Or do you want to continue using the chat box? Chat seems to be working. Teresa, I did have... Quick question again. They were wondering if you could tell us the brands of the red wines. Okay. So I'm actually going to double check on one because it's not one I'm familiar with. Oh, not going anywhere. Oh, 
Okay, so again, there are three casks, three different casks. The first one is a Basque Pinot Noir. Uh, the second one is Jackson Triggs Cabernet Sauvignon. And the third one is, believe it or not, is Naked Grape Shiraz. Thanks, Teresa. Again, all entry-level wines, but hopefully representative of the flavors of the, of the particular variety. Also, just had another question, Teresa. Mm -hmm. A little bit of housekeeping here. Um, someone's wondering what they should do with all the sample bottles from this evening. So you know what? You can you can keep the bottles. You can reuse them. Um, if at the, ne at the next time you come back, you want to return them, great. There's, There's no, no expectation. expectation. But if you know, so it's up to you. Now, Jen and Kim returned their bottles with infused vinegar. You just could have worked. <laughs> Brownie points. Brownie points. Absolutely. Actually, Actually I, I, such a nice way to return the bottles. <laughs> and they look fabulous. I did see they those do. out of the corner of my eyes. We have another question here from Chris. They're wondering, is Naked Grape from Niagara? It is. It's um, our, it's an Archero wine. So it's made here in Niagara. Yep. And uh, Chris oh, also wait, saying, By the way, sorry, Naked Grape. The reason it's called Naked Grape <laughs> is because none of the Naked Grape wines receive any oak treatment. They're right. all unoaked, so they're naked. Right. Right. Play on words, but it's clean. And someone else is saying, Chris again is saying that the little bottles would be wonderful for picnics. Yes. Yep. So yep. great idea. Yep. Always good to reuse, recycle when oh, yeah. possible. Please, if you, if you keep them, which you're welcome to do, please reuse them. Yeah, absolutely. So, any favorite pairings? Oh, Erin's funny. I like the way she thinks. Bottles are great for the airplanes. For the <laughs> airplanes. <laughs> Good one, Erin. But I didn't recommend it. <laughs> yeah. Actually. Oh, and Sue's oh, cute. Mm -hmm. Even better for movie theaters. Yep. So when um, Dave and I were in New Orleans, you know, you can walk down the streets and you can drink wine and stuff. But most of the wines you got at the, the bars were terrible. Yeah. So when we were on the plane, Dave said, collect all these little bottles that were empty, collect them and save them. And then we bought good wine and poured them into the little bottles and for us when we wandered the street. Very smart. Very smart. I'm really enjoying this Pinot Noir, Teresa. Good. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it was actually a pleasant uh, surprise. It, of course, it's a young Pinot Noir. It's not an old, earthy, you know, but, it, so it, but it's a young, fruity, drinkable Pinot Noir. And just like you said, Ontario's Pinot Noirs are, are very good. One of our better red grape right varieties here. For Pinot Noir. Yep. Uh, Mike is saying, is it the Basque Pinot Noir? And if so, it has zero carbs. Ooh. It is Basque. The Basque. It, it is, is the Basque Pinot Noir. Yep. Zero carbs. Wow. It's a good January, February wine. Hmm. You know, I've never really worried about carbs in my wine. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting one, but that's good to know. Thanks for that. Yeah, absolutely. So the cheddars oh, are probably a natural, right? 
But what are there any unusual pairings that worked? Like some of the softer ones or. We've got a couple of feedback uh, questions here. Uh, one quick correct, collect. Uh, correction, Lola saying that it's actually zero sugar, not zero carbs in the bass. And, and uh, we're also wondering, where did you buy all the different cheeses, Teresa? You know, I got all the cheeses at my local Fortino's. Now, and up until COVID, like they did not have all these individually packaged cheeses, but now there's a whole counter there's probably five different versions of the goudas and the like so not i got all the different brands but there were different flavors of each as well so there was a whole shelf of individually packaged pieces they come about six like in a little net but or in a box very smart during these times with covid if you're having well we wanted to eliminate the food handling and very smart exposure for everybody yeah so shelly's saying Teresa, that she loves the shiraz with the laughing cow okay so that's the second so first it was the chardonnay with the laughing cow and now the shiraz with the laughing cow uh, we also have another quick question from Stu saying, do we know what kind of cheese the laughing cow is? It's actually a blend of cheeses. There's some cream, but it's, um, I swore to myself I'd have it, have it on the top of my head, but it's, it's a blend of several different cheeses. Mm-hmm. I'd have to look it up, but it's about four different cheeses in the Laughing Cow. I was wondering myself because I'd never, I wasn't familiar with Laughing Cow. And I thought, hmm, is this a real cheese? But it is actually, and it's a blend. And Dale's saying um, under the odd pairing category, the Shiraz with his mushrooms is fantastic. Excellent. Oh, and what I about wonder, the Pinot Noir with the mushrooms? I was just going to ask Dale and Lola, do us a favor and do the Pinot Noir with the mushrooms. I'd like to know how that goes. And we have another quick question, Teresa, of someone's wondering if we can uh, type all the names of the wines or maybe show photos of the wines that we're trying this evening. We don't have or is that something you could do on yeah, Facebook we, afterwards? You know what? I'll do it afterwards. If, okay. if that's okay, because I have the three reds here, but the whites I'd have to. Would you post that on Facebook then? Yep. Yeah, Perfect. We'll put so it yeah. on the Burlington Wine Club Facebook page. Perfect. So then everyone can yep. take a peek at this, that. Um, yep. And this recording as well, the, the class will be on YouTube in the next couple of days. If you Wonderful. want to send me the list, I can post it all to the Facebook if you want to send me the list. Perfect. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, Danielle. Perfect. Oh, Monique, I like this. Thinking outside the box, the cab is delicious with hickory sticks. Sorry, I missed that. So Monique is saying that the Cabernet, the cab is delicious with hickory sticks. Ah. <laughs> well, that smokiness, yep. right? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good one, Monique. Thinking outside the box. Hmm. Oh, and Dale and Lola are saying the morale with the Pinot Noir is the perfect pairing. I believe it. Excellent. Good for you yeah. guys. Yeah. And delicious. so mushrooms and Pinot Noir should it are a classic pairing, mm-hmm. but it it can sometimes depend on the Pinot Noir. But but they're uh they're a natural pairing. I guess is that the earthiness, Teresa? It's the earthiness. Now this, and that's why I say this. So this is a fruity one. It's not terribly earthy. Mm. But it still is the nature of the Pinot Noir. Mm. And if you make a beef bourguignon, it's always made with Pinot Noir. And it's beef and mushrooms, or you can have a mushroom bourguignon. Um, And it's just a natural pairing. Pinot Noir is from Burgundy in the first place, and that's a natural dish. Great tip. And what would be a white wine that pairs well with mushrooms? Chardonnay. Mm. Yep. So it's going to be bigger, bolder, 
Yep. And also, it's from the same area, Burgundy. Nice. So um, Burgundy is Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and mushrooms, lots of mushrooms and earthy, yeah, tones. Delicious. Okay. So if you're okay, how about I go along and I'll do the cheese trays or how to put together a cheese tray and then we can kind of open it up for conversation. Wonderful. All right. So a cheese pie. So this was pretty limited tonight, but when to serve a cheese platter? So at a breakfast buffet, you'll often find cheese trays and an assortment of cheeses. Uh, Brunch, certainly. Um, Lunch, dinner. So really any meal, you can include a cheese tray or a cheese tray or perhaps a charcuterie board. If you add some additional things to it, can become the meal in and of itself. Um, at dinner, so this is interesting. So before dessert or instead of dessert. So we have a tendency uh, here in North America to serve a cheese tray before dinner. Um, the European custom is never to do that because a cheese tray can be very filling, right? So if you fill up on a che- on cheeses and charcuterie and all that kind of stuff, um, you have a hard time eating your meal, or at least we find that now. So, we, um, so it's either it should be the meal or you have your meal first and then serve your cheese tray after your meal. And typically, again, the French or the, the Europeans will have the cheese tray followed by the dessert. So your meal, your cheese tray, your dessert, or sometimes what we do is the cheese tray is the dessert, especially if you put some fruits on it and a little bit of chocolate or like customize your cheese tray so that it is in fact your dessert. But that's, that's, you know, one way of doing it. Or if you're just serving a cheese tray and, and a large one and a robust one and, um, and that's it. Um, okay. So what to serve? So, and I'm thinking at dinner, not anyway. So three to five different cheeses is typical and usually it's like flowers, I guess, odd numbers. So you typically have one, three, five um, cheeses. And, of course, depending on the size of the crowd, it could be seven as well. But typically three to five cheeses. Um, but also, you're better off with one really good, really solid, beautiful cheese than three cheeses that are eh, so-so or you're not sure or whatever. Like if, You know? So... Yeah. In terms of what types of cheeses, so you can do themes. Now, I quite often do a country or regional themes. So if I'm doing wines from a, t- from a particular region, so if I'm doing Bordeaux, I will try and find cheeses from Bordeaux. If I'm doing Spain is my theme, I will try and find cheeses from Spain. Um, sometimes it takes a little looking and sometimes you have to order ahead of time, but that's one way of doing it. So a country or regional theme. And certainly if you're doing a, a wine region theme, then the cheeses from that region are definitely the way to go. The other ways you can do it is say, OK, so we've got different categories of cheeses. I want to mix them up. I want a fresh cheese and a soft cheese and a hard cheese, or um, I know what wine I'm going to serve. And so I'm going to select the cheeses that I know go with that particular wine. Um, but you really have to kind of think about what cheeses you're going to serve. You need to warm them up for about 90 minutes before you serve them. Cheeses do not like to come right out of the fridge and sit there. They need uh, a bit of warmth. And it's a good idea, um, and I I did this by the packaging, but if it had been a cheese tray where they were all unwrapped, then you need to identify the cheeses. Okay, So you have little uh, flags or picks or something so people know what it is they have. Um, and then neutral baguette or water crackers. So I typically use a baguette or water crackers. 
very, very neutral, takes nothing away from the cheese. Um, but you can use flavored breads as well. So if you have, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. so if you have a borsin and you've got uh, a walnut bread that you like, but then you have to kind of match your cheeses to your breads. So you have to know what it is you're serving and what the flavors are. Um, otherwise, stick to something totally neutral. Fruit, nuts, jams. Um, yes, absolutely. They can augment a cheese tray and add some sweetness to things. Um, and I'm going to go the next one. So fruit accompaniments. So stay away from citrus fruits. So oranges and grapefruits and lemons and limes and anything like that, anything citrusy is not going to work with either your wine or your cheese. Dried fruits are really pretty much the best. Figs, dates, raisins. Um, but if you've got raisins, you need, so a Shiraz with raisins works because it's got a natural sweetness or a Zinfandel and raisins like kind of works together. Um, but dried fruits uh, work well. Um, nuts um, work really well. So walnuts, uh, pecans, and even, again, depending on your wines, you can even add some sweetness to your nuts. So I will do maple pecans, um, especially if you've got a sweet wine included um, for the dessert. Um, best fruit is pear. So pear, so if, if you're in doubt, slice up a pear and put it on your tray. It's neutral. It's fresh. It doesn't, it's not high acid. It's not going to hurt anything that you're pairing it with, um, but it'll still give you some freshness. Same with strawberries, uh, seedless grapes and kiwis. So if you want fruits for your, for your tray, those are kind of the key fruits to go with. And then lastly, so cutting cheese. And I'll let you take a look at this. So the goat cheese, you would cut in half and then half moons. Camembert, small triangles, brie, long points. And, of course, this isn't hard and fast, and you can change things up, but these are the traditional cuttings. Um, Pyramid-shaped cheese, so the French cheese that comes in a pyramid, you do a tall wedge from the center. Oka's wedges. Cheddar is small blocks, but also um, I've seen it in long blocks. And then um, positioned sort of almost crisscross. Gouda in wedges and blue in wedges. Okay, so different cheeses uh, warrant different shapes. Choosing the wine. So you can take notes from this and say, or, or your tastings and say, hey, you know what? Chardonnay was the hit here for me, and it worked with these cheeses. So I'm going to serve these three or four cheeses and a really nice Chardonnay. That's what I'm going to do. Or um, one of the most difficult things is picking cheeses from different, different types of cheeses with different textures and different um, – flavors and trying to pick one wine to go with all of them. Okay. So that's, that's tricky. You have to either figure out the cheeses that are going to go with that wine or go with a port or go with a sauterne or go with an ice wine or go with something, especially if it's for dessert, it's much safer or have a couple of different wines or the other thing is, if you're starting a meal with a cheese plate um, and you folks can eat enough, go with the sparkling. Because sparkling is probably the most versatile of all of the wines in terms of um, pairing it with uh, a diverse group of cheeses. Anyway, choosing the wine, that's the tricky part. Okay. But, yeah. So that's okay. The last one. Wonderful information, Teresa. We've got a few questions and comments okay. here. 
Chris is saying that he loves Asian pears are fantastic. Yes. A little a little bit more costly, but lasts for days once put in the fridge. Yep. So that's a wonderful tip. Yep. And if you ever want to, so uh, flatbread with uh, brie and pears and Asian pears under the grill to die for. So brie and pears are, are a really good pairing. Delicious. And Danielle's asking, how are you, how do you feel about olives or little pickles or pickled onions on your charcuterie? So you have to be careful with olives and pickles and anything pickled at all. Um, I tend to avoid them because it, they might, they're fine with the cheese and they might even complement the cheese, but they're really hard on your wines. So they're so high in acid, like anything pickled. In fact, I have um, you know, a couple of funny stories about I've worked with a chef and we've worked out what the meal is going to be and everything on the plate and we've been in agreement and we and then I get there and then the chefs will, they get creative and all of a sudden they put pickles on the plate and I'm going, ah! <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> because it doesn't go with wine. So, they're great with the cheeses. You have to be really, really careful with your wines because they can, they can hurt your wines. You've got to be careful. A little overpowering, I suppose. Danielle well, it's, says it's too uh, pickles. Um, it's too acidic. Acidic. It's mm-hmm. too. It's like so. For example, I never use regular vinegar unless it's a balsamic or a lightly flavored vinegar. Or usually, I use a white balsamic or a white wine vinegar on salads because a vinegar, like a, a vinegar on your salad, will work, can ruin your wine. I second that. And Danielle says, thank you so much. Great, great feedback. And she said that sparkling wine is, an, is a, always a good idea. And I second that, too. Yeah. When in doubt, go sparkling. Go sparkling. Wonderful. Okay. So, as always, I get a, an amazing group of volunteers that just run this club. Could not do it without Kirsten, thank you for stepping up and being co-host tonight. That was wonderful. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you for having Members- me. Yeah. Memberships. So, Sue, um, so all of you folks, if you're new, to, well, we have some guests here tonight, of course, but for all of those you that have renewed your membership in the last month, that's awesome. We're still virtual. This is like the third renewal under virtual circumstances, so... You know, we're absolutely thrilled uh, to have you back. Pick up point, Marilyn and Mike, as always, did an amazing job. Contactless pickup, everything done well. Wine and food packaging, normally I say cooking, but we didn't actually do any cooking this time. But I tell you, we had to fill three, label, fill, um, break the labels, label, fill 300 of those little bottles of wine. And then um, package, you know, 50 kits with all the different cheeses and things like that. So Dorothy, Lorraine, Kathy, my usual folks, just awesome. Wine sales, Monique, you had a bit of a break this month. You didn't have to do any wine sales. Uh, Danielle, you've gone over and above over the last couple of months. That's just our Facebook has been terrific. Um, our... Um, agents, our partners are really appreciative of what all you've done. Like the fact that you put their specials up there and you're so timely and put everything up there. Anyway, thank you very, very much. It's, uh, thank you all. Like, it's awesome. I have such an awesome team. Um, next month, Dan Duran, Darlene Emberley, formerly of Univins and Spirits. Anyway, we'll see what she has to offer. And we're thinking we're going to go back to, if it's if we feel safe and if we can do our um, rapid tests and all that kind of stuff, then we'll actually cook again. Okay. So we can, ugh, 
get rid of that. I'm going to go to larger mode. And if you want to unmute folks, Kirsten. Yep. Okay. I don't, what am I doing here? Just need to stop share at the top of the screen. Oh. Uh, Pause share? Uh, uh, there's, there's a red button. It should stop, say yep. stop, stop share. share. Hey, there hey. we go. Thanks, That's Danielle. <laughs> You're the best. That was great, <laughs> Teresa. Thank you. Awesome. Oh, no worries. Very well then. Teresa, thanks okay. for letting us share in. This is this has been absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm I'm glad you enjoyed it. And you can come fun. anytime. If I could figure out how to do the chat line thing, I would have, you know, eaten or texted you a couple of times, but couldn't figure it out. There's a little chat. There's a little box at the bottom that says a chat. I brought it, but I didn't know how to set it. <clears throat> anyway, it doesn't matter. You just click on Anyway, next time. We'll show you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thank you, you, everybody. Uh, thank you for keeping us going. <laughs> oh, no worries. You know, it's been fun. It's, you guys are all great. <laughs> yep. And lots of wonderful comments, and thank you. And so many, uh, we enjoyed the night. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Lydia and Julia, Marilyn and Mike. Lots, thank you for our, so many positive comments and feedbacks. Wonderful to have you all with us tonight. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Awesome. <laughs>